question, then I'll call on you. And um, we're going to stay on the topic of the reorganization. And we have a website, just FYI, if you haven't seen it yet. It's rcda.org backslash uh, reorganization. There's a lot of information on that page, including frequently asked questions. And we will be putting updates on there as well and adding information as it comes in. So we have Bishop Edward Scharfenberger and Frank Brennan, who's an attorney with the law firm uh, Nolan Heller and Kaufman here in Albany. Um, he's been serving as lead reorganization counsel for the diocese. And I will turn it over to Bishop Ed. Thank you, Kathy. So today the Roman Catholic Diocese of Albany has filed a uh, Chapter 11 reorganization petition in the Northern Bankruptcy Court. Uh, this decision has not come in any quick or precipitous way. It's been a long haul to this point. We have, over the better course of the year, attempted to uh, to basically to encourage um, universal uh, uh, mediation of uh, the over 400 claims as a result of the Child Victims Act. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we encountered resistance from many members, uh, many of the plaintiffs' uh, counsel. But nonetheless, we attempted to settle as many cases as we possibly could with the resources that we had. And we settled uh, upwards of 50 cases. But we reached the limit of our resources in order to be able to do that and yet to continue our own obligations uh, to those who uh, uh, we must serve. Because we serve so many people here. You know, we have, it's a diocese, 10,000 square miles. And uh, even though we are a diocese of 312 Catholics, and we serve many, many more people as a result. You know, we, we minister to the poor, we have a ministry of education, and many of those who attend our schools are, are, are non-Catholics. And so we consider ourselves citizens of the entire community, and not only the capital region, but throughout the diocese, which is largely rural. So uh, in order to maintain our, our mission, uh, we're at a point right now where the next step seems to be to do this. We don't see any other alternative. Unfortunately, we know it's expensive. We know it can be time-consuming. But uh, it seems to be the best way to protect everyone. Uh, I said from day one that uh, my desire is to get... Uh, I realize that, that uh, money cannot possibly compensate survivors of sexual abuse. I continue to apologize to anyone that has suffered so unjustly uh, by this, uh, this scourge, uh, and to do everything to accompany all of those, not only those who are abused by, by clergy, but anyone that has suffered uh, in silence because of incidents of abuse in their lives. But um, uh, we, we, we need to do this at this point, and uh, of course, as you know, as a result of a filing, a bankruptcy filing, that all uh, litigation uh, is paused or is stayed. Uh, I know there are also uh, uh, pensioners from St. Clair's that you're all familiar with, I think, that also have uh, litigation uh, that is pending. And it remains um, unresolved as to actually what was responsible for the collapse of that pension, but it, it does not change my desire to reach out to every one of those pensioners and not only uh, that they come forward, but actually to hear their story. And I say this repeatedly, uh, I want to hear anyone that wants to uh, come and tell their story. I am here to listen. And uh, we have other people that assist us in this. Our, our, our assistance coordinator uh, is, is also very, very much available. And uh, the diocese itself has a process uh, that is not uh, beyond just the litigation where anybody that wishes to come forward with a claim can do that, even a claim at canon law. So we're here for the long range. We have a, uh, I won't call it a program, but a process uh, of hope and healing to assist all of those who are survivors. And this is ongoing and will continue regardless of where the litigation and the bankruptcy proceedings ultimately go. We are going to be here. And we are here in order to help. We have over the last uh, 20 years, the last two decades, and not only in the Diocese of Albany, but throughout the United States, instituted uh, uh, safeguards to protect our, our, our young people and our vulnerable people. Uh, and uh, we do background checks, for example, of, uh, of all of our employees and survivors. And we have programs that educate people on how to recognize 
incidents where abuse may be occurring and to make reports. Uh, and uh, So uh, much progress has been made, but much yet needs to be done. And uh, I'm convinced that while uh, financial settlements are able to help in some way sometimes to help people get counseling, that in the long run it is personal presence and, and our being there for others, which of course is essential to the mission of the church. Uh, Pope Francis always talks about uh, reaching out to those in the margins, and there's nobody who is more marginalized than somebody that has suffered abuse. So my heart goes out to all of those who have suffered and continue to, particularly those who suffer in silence. This, uh, this uh, action that we're taking right now is meant to help us ultimately come to a way of marshalling all of the resources we have and to see them distributed in as equitable, as fair a way as possible to as many who can, uh, can help us uh, understand uh, by their stories, by telling their stories of what their needs are, and to be able to assist them in any way we can. That's what we do as church, and that's what I want to continue to do. Uh, and I also have present here uh, uh, Frank Brennan, who is our legal counsel, uh, will be able to answer any technical questions in general about the process of the uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy itself. Any questions? Sure. Sure. You said this was in an effort as the best way to protect everyone. How is this going to protect those claimants and the pensioners? How does that protect them? Well, the, uh, I did, uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know that this protects them. This would be some way to address their needs at the present time. I hesitate to use the word compensation because I don't think you can fully compensate for sexual abuse, but in some small way, we want to, uh, we respect these, the legislation, the CBA, and we want all of those who have filed claims to have some form of relief, uh, financial relief. The actual uh, protection is done in other ways besides this, and it's to have policies in place, which we do, so that uh, everybody that works with us, everybody that, whether it's on a volunteer or an employment basis, is fully aware of uh, of their responsibilities to, to protect uh, vulnerable adults and, and, and young people. And uh, we have an ongoing process of education and of reporting, and that's a way in which we can ensure that all of our environments, a safe environment program, are safe wherever we operate in any way, our schools, our churches, and any other agency of the diocese. Okay. You're welcome. That's a good question. Now, part of, as you know, the term that's often referred to as Chapter 11 reorganization, part of the process is to take the time to look at all of our operations and uh, to see whether or not there is room for perhaps doing it in a more efficient way. Uh, it's always focused on what our mission is, and our mission is ultimately the salvation of souls, and we accompany people also in their material needs as well, too. So uh, well, we can only do that with the resources that we have. So there's two parts to this. One is identifying what are the assets we have for which we can fulfill our mission, but that has to be based upon a very, very clear uh, understanding of what our mission is, and to make sure that everything that we do institutionally in the diocese uh, meets that mission. So we don't want any excess, uh, uh, I hate to use the word fat, but you know, nothing that, that this is not oriented towards the mission. And this process gives us an opportunity to be able to do that. So I want no, uh, I want no hidden corners. You know, uh, we we operate, we try to operate in, op in an atmosphere of transparency. We publish our financials every year; they're audited. Uh, but I, I want at the end of the process everybody to know that uh, what we say is is what we do. We, we what we preach is what we want to do in, the, in our everyday mission in fulfilling that. What impact will this have, if any, on local churches and schools? Yeah, local schools and churches are, by New York State law, uh, uh, corporations, uh, independent corporations. They have their own corporate entity, their own trustees. And uh, so the short answer to your question is no immediate effect. In the process, we're going to be asking for assistance from churches uh, uh, and financial assistance in, in paying into ultimately 
uh, what the lawyers like to call the pot, you know, what would be distributed. Uh, but uh, uh, their own operations would not be affected by this because it is the diocese itself that is filing, not the individual parishes uh, or schools. So I do not anticipate any change in the operation of parishes and schools because they're following their own mission, uh, which is protected uh, by, by the corporate law of New York State, which also follows the structure of church law, canon law. And those laws go back uh, upwards of 150 years. That is, a, that is exactly what I would expect lawyers to say, but what I, what I think that it has to be understood is that uh, our approach is much broader than just defending ourselves legally. Uh, we have a mission to everyone uh, that, that our faith tells us to serve, and this is the best way in which I can do this, and yet in a responsible sort of way. So uh, that may be one way of looking at it, but our mission is so much broader than merely just of legal protection uh, and, uh, because we want our mission to continue to be able to do whatever we can to assist others in every way and primarily survivors of sexual abuse right now but also to continue to do the good works that we do in education in, in service to the poor uh, in our, our social outreach programs feeding the hungry and all of the missions that of the gospel that uh, basically are attempts to fulfill the beatitudes um, that would not be for me to determine. If I had my druthers, this would have been done yesterday. And I want to see this as soon as possible. But uh, we'll get the best arguments we can in court to keep the process flowing. But I can't give any uh, timeline because I don't know. I mean, you can take a look at what has happened in other dioceses around the state. And one of the reasons I did everything possible to avoid this juncture and to try to bring all the parties together was to avoid the long delay and sometimes, unfortunately, the acrimony that, that attends bankruptcy cases. So the sooner the better. Yes. Uh, do you have anything planned if what you currently have planned under Chapter 11 does not work to hopefully avoid Chapter 7? Well, I understand and the, the, uh, my attorney could probably give you a better answer than I could hear. But the Chapter 7 is not one of those things that is an option, you know, for a church institution. We're going to be here. We're going to stay here. And uh, we'll do whatever we can to make sure that we settle all of the claims as best as we can, as reasonably as we can. So. Okay. James. Okay. Following up on the question from 13, those same emails from those lawyers are also telling us there's about $600 million in assets. What are we doing with that $600 million? Well, because that's, uh, that's, that's a, a, a claim that the lawyers have made. Now, I don't want to be too flip about this, too, but I probably could have come up with a similar figure if I went on Zillow and did the value of every parish. But we can't sell parishes, you know. You can't, and nobody wants to buy a church anyway, so even if you evaluate a church. So it may be a little bit Pollyanna-ish, you know. Uh, I, I just want the truth, quite, quite frankly. If we, if we had that much in our resources to distribute, I'd be the first to want to dole it out. So uh, I hope that out of this process we'll get the truth and, and maybe something everybody can agree to. Okay. Anybody else? Was there any specific conversation or event that triggered this decision? This has been talked about for months, if not years. Well, it, we had come to the point where actually our financials were showing that we were going to have a shortfall in our ability to maintain our pension and our, and also to be, pay our pay our employees. So our my financial manager would tell me we can't go much longer, and uh, and we chose this particular day because it was gives us time so that we won't miss the next paycheck uh, period that comes out at the end of the month. So uh, it, it was now or never basically, and we so we had to make that decision. Yeah, that was a real possibility. I was being told that by my financial managers. So we, we, that will not happen. But uh, that was why we came to the point that we've settled uh, to the point that we can no longer, we, there's nothing left really to do that. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, 
else? All the questions don't have to be asked today, you know, so if you come up with other questions as we go forward, I'll meet with you at any time, and, and uh, hopefully that as we go through this, uh, we'll all learn something from it. But I'm committed to see the process through, uh, and, uh, and I thank you for your presence. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You Thanks should all have my doing. contact information as well on the yeah. press release, so please call me or email me if you have any questions and make them your starting point for the diocese. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you.